Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us as NAN celebrates MLK Junior Day. To promote health and safety for the Black community against COVID-19, NAN has embarked on the largest survey of the African-American community to date to gain a deeper understanding um, and insight into almost why 50% of Black people report that they will not take the vaccine. NAN partnered with Data Lingual Analytics, which is an African-American-led data science research company. And we've partnered with the experts from Columbia University's Data Science Institute. We are really appreciative of all the responses we got. Um, we've gotten over 6,000 responses. And, and a lot of those responses, people took the time to indicate that our guest today, Dr. Nuna Smith, is one of the trusted figures that they look to for information about COVID-19 and the virus. Dr. Nuna Smith is a American health professional. She, as of January 20th, will become the COVID-19 task force health equity lead for the Biden administration. So we are deeply grateful to have her join us today. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I will just start with some of the questions. A large percentage of our survey respondents indicated that their reluctance to take the vaccine was from a concern that they have pre-existing conditions, including autoimmune diseases and allergies. About 62% of our survey respondents indicated that they were really concerned about that issue. So I was wondering how we might mitigate that and any responses you had around that. So, you know, thank you. And thank you, of course, the network for doing that robust survey. Those are the exact kind of data that we need. Um, you know, to your question, those 62% of people, they're asking absolutely the right question, right? Are these vaccines safe specifically for me? So first, you know, I would advise just the, the regular disclaimer, please do reach out, talk to your own healthcare providers about the things that are specific to you. Hopefully your provider is someone who knows you well and who you trust and you can have these conversations. But I will speak to this question generally and we know the CDC has given us guidance on this. Um, they have said very clearly that people with autoimmune disorders um, can in fact take the, the vaccines. And I think that's important, specifically these mRNA vaccines, and we'll have a chance to talk about that in a, in a bit. You know, one of the major considerations um, with autoimmune disorders, I think that's rightly raised, is really about whether or not your immune system can mount the robust response we'd wanna see from the vaccines. So it's really less a question about safety and more a question of, of how well it would work. Um, that question is often tied to the medications you take for autoimmune disorders. Um, again, why it's important to talk to your doctor about what makes sense for you or your provider, but sometimes just changing when you take the vaccine can actually make a big difference in terms of optimizing that, that benefit. So I'll turn to uh, talk about allergies because I think that's another great question. Um, so when we think about the vaccines, the precautions, tied to allergies, that applies to very, very few people. So the CDC has, has provided guidance for us on this as well. Um, so if you have allergies, you know, as I do, to foods and environmental triggers like pollen or animals, you know, it's still safe to get vaccinated. I'm gonna get vaccinated tomorrow. But people with a history of allergies to, um, to oral medications, a family history of severe allergic reactions, you can also still get vaccinated, right? So for whom is it not safe in terms of allergies? If you've ever had an immediate severe reaction to a vaccine before or any type of injectable medicine, that's really where we say pause, you know, talk to your, talk to your provider about that. But for the vast um, you know, number of people who are living with allergies, this is safe. And just to the last question, um, or the last point rather, like the pre-existing conditions, I want us to be really clear that, you know, the pre-existing conditions that we know make a big difference in terms of getting vaccinated are the things like diabetes and heart disease, asthma, um, which I also live with. So it's critical for us to get vaccinated when we're living with those pre-existing conditions. We know it makes a big difference for, for our health. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, and so I guess with, as a follow-up to that question, do we have enough information about the vaccine um, and its effects on the black community? If, if you could talk a little bit about the clinical trials and how we're able to know that it's safe for us to take. Perfect, great. Um, so we do have a whole lot of information, I would start by saying sadly, on the effects of COVID-19 on the black community. And so just to sort of anchor us in those data and what that means for our families and our community, right? I, uh, I, I, I fear people become numb to some of the statistics as we talk about them, what this actually means to say almost four times as likely in the black community to end up hospitalized, you know, almost three times as likely to die from COVID-19. So what does that mean? You know, one in 735 Black Americans has died from COVID-19. If you think about our representation in the population, around 44, that is a lot of parents, siblings, neighbors, loved ones that we've lost. So I think we always have to begin our conversation, sort of why is there the urgency of now to have a conversation about vaccines and vaccination? You know, it's because COVID-19 is decimating our communities in particular. So. You know, the question about the vaccination, I, I think that's a, a very uh, fair question to ask what we know. And we do, what we, we know in terms of the clinical trials, for example, Pfizer and Moderna. So those are the two that have been authorized for use. Uh, in those late stage trials, there was about 10% representation. Um, this is, you know, 75,000 participants in those trials. So when we say 10% of the people participating in those trials were black, those are significant numbers. And I'm grateful for their participation. And what we see when we look at those sub, sub analyses, that's how we ask that question. You know, we find that the vaccines perform the same, just as safe and effective uh, for Black Americans as for, as for everybody else in the trial. So we should feel very confident about that. That's good, that's comforting. And one of the things I've heard a lot um, just through conversations with my friends is you've never, you haven't had anyone die from the vaccine, but a lot of us are dying from COVID-19. So that is really grounding. Um, another question that came up a lot and a concern that came up a lot through the surveys, why should we trust the government with the vaccine based on past and current behavior around racism? Yeah. Um, so absolutely. And we know, I mean, this is real, right? Centuries of structural racism have decimated our, our, our communities really put us at great uh, disadvantage. And the government has been uh, all too often an active player in that. Now the incoming president, President-elect Biden has, has said unequivocally that black Americans, other people of color in this country, you know, have not always been treated with the dignity, the honesty, the respect um, that frankly is deserved uh, by their government as well as by the scientific community. We all know that that sort of distrust that many people come to this conversation with, you know, has been earned over over time, and that this isn't all about uh, history; it's about now as well. So, at its core, the decision about getting vaccinated we know is about trust. So, I appreciate that question. Right? Where should we be placing our trust? Um, and I place mine, and I think we should place our trust in science and evidence and data. So I want to be clear that the processes that got us to where we are today with these two authorized vaccines, you know, those processes occurred without political interference. This is very important, without political interference. They're open, transparent. I trust those scientists who work tirelessly to get us here today. So the scientists who've led this process, they've all agreed these vaccines are safe, they're effective. In terms of making sure that the vaccines are easily acceptable for everyone, right? So including for black people, including for communities where it's been hardest hit, we have to do that work. And we have to make sure that when you're ready to say yes to getting vaccinated, that there aren't barriers that stand, stand in the way. So this is what we know, the vaccines are safe, they're effective, right? The processes have been transparent. I have confidence in them. And we know at the end of the day that getting vaccinated is what will save you know, our lives and our family's lives. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate what you mentioned about um, being able to access the vaccine 
once you're ready to take it. A lot of our survey respondents did mention that they're reluctant to take it now. They want to wait and see a little longer, but they're worried that if they don't take it as right now in the, in the in the rollout, that they won't have the opportunity to take it down the line. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit to the distribution of the vaccine and any plans that um, your team has to make sure that that is equitable Absolutely. and accessible through our community. Yes, thank you. This is the top priority of incoming administration. President-elect Biden has repeatedly said that the vaccine distribution needs to be efficient and equitable. So we have to think with intentionality, and we are. We are making the plans for this. This is critical, right? When you're ready to, to take the vaccination, it has to be convenient, right? It has to be uh, free. We know that, you know, there shouldn't be administrative costs that get in the way of people taking the vaccine. Um, we have to keep in mind the reality of things like pharmacy deserts. So many of our communities really don't have immediate access, right? And so whereas a lot of folks may get their vaccinations typically at their neighborhood pharmacy, we have to make sure that we have other plans in place, be they sort of mobile outreach, standing up vaccination, you know, sites and centers where people know in their neighborhoods and communities that has to be important. We have to think about things like transportation and make sure there aren't transportation barriers as well. Um, but the federal government incoming is, is serious about this, right? And so we will work with states and local municipalities and others on, you know, on making sure that the plans for, for access and distribution are equitable. Perfect. Um, and I think a, a long way in, in getting people to feel a little bit more comfortable is knowing what is, what's in this vaccine. And um, I saw a lot of people say, we're going to get COVID-19 from the vaccine. So can you um, explain it to me? I'm a policy advisor. I'm not a, a health worker. I'm not a scientist. Is there a way in layman's terms that you can let us know what's in these vaccines? And, and can I get COVID-19 from it? Great question. So if you know, if you if you looked at the ingredients as we all do, like in our kitchen, it's a very <laughs> simple list. All right. So just four things. There is the, the mRNA or the messenger RNA. So that's the thing that we need to actually get the job done. Everything else in there is about kind of keeping that mRNA safe and getting it where it needs to go. So we wrap the mRNA up in a little blanket, like bubble wrap of something we call lipids or like fats, right? Um, we have to kind of keep these, these salts in there to kind of keep the, it's the acidity of it where it should be. So there are four salts for that. And then there is a sugar in there, a simple sucrose really, that kind of helps that bubble wrap uh, stay intact kind of when those vaccines are in their super cold state. And that's, that's it, that's what's in there. Um, now really the, you know, the more maybe complex conversation about this is that mRNA, right? That messenger RNA which has gotten a lot of attention because I know people are like, was this new approach and it happened so quickly and we're really concerned. And I think that's a really good point. So I just want to speak to that for, for one moment. Um, we, we have a scientific basis for these new technologies and vaccines, this mRNA that goes back over a decade. Really was the Obama administration invested quite substantial resource in getting this technology to a place where we could just rapidly, as we've seen in this past year, advance it. You know, teams are really diverse scientists have been working on mRNA and getting these mRNA vaccines where they are. So important to recognize that, right? The representation and diversity in the scientific community, um, as well as in the participants as we talked about before. So what the vaccines actually do is they give our bodies what I call a, a harmless preview, right? Of the virus that allows us to create a defense system so that when we actually see the real virus and get exposed, you know, our bodies are ready to go into immediate attack and, and fight it. So really just critical. If you remember only kind of one thing today, it is that it is impossible, impossible to get COVID-19 from taking the vaccine. 100% impossible. Okay. And the mRNA, that's not gonna change the way our DNA works or anything no. like that. Okay. No, no, I think it's so, it's so important. I mean. You know, we, I'm fully aware that there is, you know, just a lot of information out there. 
And it's going to be hard for, for everyone just getting bombarded with all this information. So I appreciate opportunities like this to be in conversation, to speak to what we know and, you know, and, and what we don't know. But the things we know for sure, this, they do not interfere with the DNA or our bodies. You know, I, I know there are concerns out there about infertility too. There's nothing out there to support that as well. And really importantly, that you cannot contract COVID-19 from taking the vaccine. This is, this is, you know, I think it's also important for people to know what to expect when you get vaccinated. So just like we get vaccinated for other things, um, you know, you might have some soreness where you get the injection for, you know, a few days. Sometimes as evidence of our body doing what it's supposed to, we may feel a little bit achy, a little unwell, we may get a little fever. All of that is completely normal. So we should have as many conversations about kind of what that may take Tylenol and, and, and it'll be okay. So, you know, just very grateful to have the chance to speak to some of these things that I know are kind of out there in our, in our orbits. I get texts all the time from good friends asking these same questions. I really appreciate you taking the time and I'm sure Nan will do more surveys, especially geared at distribution and how making sure that there's equitable uh, distribution in our communities because we've seen how it was hard for us to get testing even when it came to like the economic pieces, it was hard for our businesses to get those loans. So we're really big on making sure that there's equal justice, equal access for everyone. Um, so I hope we can speak again in the near future but thank you for taking the time on King Day.